And now, a KCTS9 Digital Studios original, made possible with your support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Enrique Cerna, and welcome to this Facebook Live conversation with Washington Congressman Dave Reichert. Uh, we are going to be talking about a variety of issues here. Uh, questions that you have sent to us via Facebook and also on KCTS 9. And Congressman, uh, well, welcome. Good to have you here. You've had an eventful week here in this congressional break, which hasn't been much of a break, but I just want to show yeah. you something here. Yeah. I got... Uh, uh, just a few emails. We've received over 1,500 emails. We think actually it might be even closer to about 2,000. We'll give yeah. you all these afterwards, yeah, by good. the way, too. Thank you. Uh, but these are questions that people have been uh, submitting, and they want to know your opinion on a wide variety of things, but you know what the top question is. Why are you not holding any town halls? Yeah. This is not a town hall. This is from Mike in Renton. Yeah. Why are you afraid to meet with us? As he's yeah. putting it, he says, <clears throat> you know, this is like a digital wall that you're hiding behind. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is the new technology, right, that's available. We can reach a, a lot of people through this medium. And, uh, and so I'm happy to be here today. And, and yes, it's not only been an exciting week, but uh, an exciting 12 years in Congress. And, uh, uh, you know, our, our mission is to, is to continue to serve the people of the 8th District and be that, that voice for, for people back in Washington, D.C., and have the heart of a servant. But you're and under so, fire. You and, and other Republicans are under fire. Well, you know, uh, I've been under fire before, and, and you can define that in, you know, whatever way you want to, but not only uh, from, uh, you know, my, my previous career, uh, but also um, as as the congressional career has progressed, uh, the Tea Party, of course, has been uh, one that's had me in its, their sights uh, back a few years ago, and now it's 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 you know it's another group of, of people who are understandably concerned. Um, they're they're afraid. Uh, I feel that myself. My family's expressed it to me. Uh, we've met with our constituents and continue to meet with our constituents, but. I, my uh, view of town halls today, it's degenerated into a shouting, yelling, and screaming match. And if you watch some of the town halls that have been uh, attempted, at least, across the country, um, almost all of them, at least that I've seen, the, the member of Congress will show up and immediately be shouted down. Or uh, one I saw just the other day uh, on CNN, the member arrived, one question was asked, the member started to answer the question and was shouted down. It took 45 minutes uh, of waiting. The second question couldn't even be asked and the answer to the first question couldn't even be delivered because of the, the ruckus in, in the room. So she ended up walking out, which is not a good thing to do. So just let me say that when the Tea Party came to us and demanded town halls, we said, uh, look, I will meet with anyone and everyone from the group, but we're going to do it in small groups so we can have a civil uh, discussion and discourse. We'll have an hour together with eight people or so, and you can ask me anything you want to, and we can have actually a productive, and that's what I'm looking for, productive exchange of ideas where I can answer your questions and you can get solid answers from But those T Hall <coughs> meetings during the time of the uh, you know Obamacare and particularly Democrats were the ones that were targeted during that time in two thousand nine. They they were No, not, I'll disagree were, I'll disagree with that one. Well <laughs> I mean I was the target of the Tea Party. I, I represent a district that from the beginning is leaned to the left. And even today where some people say, well you know he's totally safe our district today is, is measured as even. It's a 50-50 district. And uh, even if it wasn't, I would still have the same beliefs that I, that I have today. We were targeted because we were described as rhinos, Republican in name only. We weren't conservative enough. So if the Democrats were targeted, um, you know, and I, I would suppose that they were, but we were targeted just as heavily, and we've been through this before with the far right. So this is not a new experience for us, but there is a definite increase in intensity um, 
and and uh, I, I, I am very sensitive to that. Okay, so today you had, I don't know, I, I heard as much as about a thousand people that came out to your Issaquah office to uh, rally and again demand that you talk to them, that you meet yeah. the, with them at a town hall situation. Yeah. I guess, what would it take for you to meet in a town hall situation? Yeah, I think the first thing really, uh, that, you know, that we did is, you know, as this thing started to sort of um, heat up and expand, my district office, uh, district director, actually reached out to these leaders first, invited them into the office, uh, and she actually held meetings with some of the leaders of Indivisible and some of the, uh, some of the other uh, groups that wanted to meet. I've been on the phone over the last few days with uh, one person at a time, a married couple here and there at a time, a part of this group. I'm willing to talk to anybody. It's been on the phone, in the car, driving from one appointment to another appointment. Um, what I would like to do, and, and this is a description of the process that we're taking here, is to build a relationship first with, with uh, the people that, um, that we're talking about today. And once we have a relationship, let's then expand the group. And, and Because then I think that we can find some common ground and build on that to find solutions. I'm willing to work uh, together with, with anyone and everyone, but I, I'm not willing to place my, my staff uh, in, in a security situation. I'm not willing to have my constituent safety um, uh, put uh, at risk. And um, we have to remember you know, there have been occasions in recent history where members of Congress have been hurt and or their staff and constituents. And just for our office, very quickly, is you know, we've had experiences already where people have shoved their way into our office pushed our staff up against the wall, we've had to call the police, we've had people arrested, we've had people placed into a mental institution. Um, we don't, I don't want to do that. I want to sit down and talk to people and work this out, find a solution to the problems that this nation is, is facing. We can only do that when we have a discourse that's respectful. So at this point, you don't feel that you have that possibility of doing that, uh, but you want to work with the people that are coming to well, protest what, with you to try what, to find a way to do this? What I'm, what I'm excited about doing is to meeting with people uh, in an eight-person you know, person setting and moving forward from there. So anybody that wants to meet uh, in that sort of a setting where we can have that discussion, again, respectful discussion, um, at, all they have to do is call the office, we'll get it on the schedule, and I'll be happy to meet with anybody. But, but I am not going to do, let me make this very clearly stated again, I will not do a town hall with four or five hundred people. They're not productive. It's, it's just a moment that people, some people, not all, some people want to use um, and, and, you know, to, to voice their op opinions, sometime in a very loud, uh, very rude and obscene way. Some of the phone calls we're getting, matter of fact, have caused me to come to this conclusion. Uh, one day, my staff of four people in Issaquah answered seven hundred phone calls. Now, you would think that maybe 50-50, 50, 50, 50 were negative, 50 were positive. In fact, that's not the case. 85% of the calls, they estimate, were, were people who were, I'll give you an example, we have a, a wounded warrior that uh, works in my office. And in an attempt to connect with people on the phone, he would share his experience and We've had people actually say to him, Enrique, you know what, I wish the hell you'd go back there and not make it back this time. Uh, or, a, a, you know, a person who called in the other day who said, I'm praying to God, Congressman, that you are killed uh, at a line, uh, her thing was get caught in a landslide and buried alive. Um, that's just samplings of, of what we're getting. And, and I am wanting to meet with people who aren't thinking that way, but who are thinking, you know what, I want to work with the congressman and his staff to make this a better country. I'm not happy with some of the things Donald Trump is doing either. Do you think that Donald Trump and what he has said in many, and, and continues to say and has added to what you're becoming a target oh, of? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, um, I, 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 I would say yes to that. Uh, there's no doubt ab about that. Um, you know, I'll just 
repeat again because some people are calling in saying, you know, how could you support a president like this? Well, first of all, um, when he insulted veterans, I immediately said, I will not endorse Donald Trump. When he admitted to sexually assaulting women, I said, I will not vote for Donald Trump, and I did not vote for Donald Trump. In any other instance, if I heard a statement like that that any other person had made, and the statute of limitations was still in effect, and it happened in King County back in the day when I was uh, you know, working for the sheriff's office, I would have arrested that person. That was a confession. But obviously, that happened years ago. Statute of limitations is up. It's still in my heart. You don't talk and brag about assaulting women. That was uh, totally, um, just really unbelievable from, from my point of view. So um, I, I do think, yes. OK, so he's called the media, the press, his enemy, and the enemy yeah. of the country. Do you agree with right. that? No. Um, do I agree with everything the press has, has written about me? Oh, why not? No. <laughs> But uh, what, I, what I do, uh, I mean, I, I strongly disagree with the president in this regard that he might be unhappy about some of the news uh, reports uh, regarding his comments and his, his uh, executive orders and directives. But the thing, one of the things that makes this country free is the freedom of speech. And one of the standards, the standard bearers of the freedom of speech uh, is our free media. As soon as you start to clamp down and close down uh, our free media uh, and the information um, highway that they provide to our citizens, um, our freedom for all of us then is at stake. Okay, we got to get to the questions. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Here. Lots of questions. Sure. Um, this is from Glenn and Leavenworth. I read mm -hmm. your press release and understand that you think the Affordable Care Act is too expensive, too limited in its choices. But the Republican plan to convert our state's Apple Care program, which is the health care program here, to a block grant and shift expenses to individuals using health savings while giving tax breaks to the wealthy is no solution. What's your solution yeah. then to make health care affordable for us and attractive for insurance company? And by the way, there is uh, NBC News uh, recently reported that there is a more favorable view about Obamacare these days, particularly on some of the issues of protections for individuals and pre-existing conditions. Sure, yeah. I, I will not support uh, a health care uh, bill that does not include replacement. And, and so when we talk about, uh, in our office, when we talk about health care, we're talking about repeal and replace. And it's going to happen. It, it's it's, it's going to happen. So we've got to make sure that the replacement language is in this bill. And that's going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Pre-existing conditions language will be in the bill. Those with pre-existing conditions will continue to have coverage. Uh, children under the age of 26 will continue to be covered under their parents' health insurance plan. Um, Medicare will not be changed under, this, uh, under the replacement language. Um, the, the, the block grant language and the cap language that's being talked about is, is, is really only being applied right now in the discussions that I've been involved with toward Medicaid um, expansion. And only to one, one group, of course, in the expansion, um, in the expansion uh, um, uh, care, uh, definition, and that is some people who are defined as being single, able-bodied um, people who are on Medicaid. And, and uh, those people will have a, an off-ramp. So two to five years, they, they will, they'll be on an off-ramp and be gently moved to another insurance policy where they will receive either continued uh, subsidies and or tax credits in order to afford and pay for, help pay for an insurance plan. No one is going to lose coverage. Let me, let me just make that clear again. No one will lose, lose coverage. And I will not vote for and not support a health care plan that doesn't have repeal. The president has said that he wants this thing repealed and replaced, and he wants it done fast. Is it going to be done fast? I don't see how that can be done fast. Yeah. So there, there is a process. And, and the first process, the first step in the process is this reconciliation bill that will come up in the next couple of weeks, um, first two weeks in, in March. <clears throat> And that is going to be the, the main repeal and replace bill. Um, some of the replacement language is still being discussed because it, 
it is tied to the, the long list of taxes that are associated with the ACA. And I can go into those, but too detailed. Right. The, unless, unless the audience wants me to or you want to go into that. We have too many questions. So the, we'll okay, the second piece would be um, Tom Price, as the Secretary of Health, will have the same authority that Secretary Sebelius had under the ACA language to open up the market and create a marketplace where people can buy insurance plans off the exchanges. And the third piece is a possible piece of legislation further down the line. So you talk about out, um, kind of further out down the, down the path here, um, would be a piece of legislation that would require 60 votes from the Senate that needs to be bipartisan. All right, next question here. I want to move to uh, Dan from Sammamish. Why did you vote to weaken the Office of Congressional Ethics earlier this year? Congress reversed course on this vote, but only after a lot of negative publicity. Yeah. No promise has been made not to take another vote on this issue, merely to, shel merely to shelve the issue temporarily. Yeah, so, so this, this is, uh, you know, this, I'm glad this question was asked because this is actually a Democrat and Republican uh, concern. Um, there, there is the office, office of Ethics that have had, and, and both parties have recognized this and made statements in regard to this uh, ethics office. They have had broad authority to make um, uh, public some of uh, some ethics, so-called ethics violations by members of Congress, and then the, the and then the investigation goes forward by this office and discovered that no wrongdoing was done. The damage has been done. The politician, whoever he or she might be, has already been labeled as having committed some offense, but then it's found not to be an offense, and to reel that back in is a very difficult, and it's, and it's cost some members tens of thousands of dollars to defend themselves against um, erroneous charges. So my vote on this this was not a congressional vote. This was a rules vote within, within the congressional, uh, within the Republican Conference Caucus, as some people mm -hmm. might know it. So, um, someone asked for a um, a sealed vote, and so what happens then when you do that is you get a piece of paper and you write yes or no. Well, I I uh, you don't have to tell anybody. The people, ne you know, the members of Congress sitting next to me don't even get to know how I voted because I write it on a piece of paper and fold it up and pass it down the aisle. Um, but I came out of that meeting and I was asked how I voted and I shared it with the public because I have a, I, my reason for voting yes is, number one, I think that this agency has no oversight whatsoever and every member of a citizen of this country has the right to due process. Whether you're a member of Congress and whether people in the country like it or not, we are citizens of the United States, so all I did was vote for additional oversight, additional protections, due process for members of Congress. This was not to try and get people a free ticket to Disney World. This was, this was all about our constitutional rights. And by the way, I didn't have to tell anybody how I voted, but I came out and said, you know what, I voted yes for that. Now, what we're going to try to do is the Democrats and Republicans are behind closed doors working on how they can fix this. But when we took that vote, the Democrats, I'm just explaining now the honesty yeah. of the politics, the Democrats took that vote, even though they supported the change in the rule, they took that vote and made it a political message. Okay, let's talk about uh, immigration. Let's <coughs> talk about the crackdown that has just been happening. Uh, today, the president called it a successful military operation with the immigration crackdown. But this is a question that comes from Megan and Covington. Department of Homeland Security recently laid out the Trump administration's plans for aggressive enforcement of the immigration laws, including using local law enforcement officers to detain undocumented people during routine stops. As a former sheriff, what is your position on this? Also, do you support the Trump plan on immigration or will you join representatives in this state that will fight to protect immigrants already here? Yeah. Well, I, I think if anybody's watched my record on this, I am one of the few Republicans. In fact, you can go to our website and you can listen to a, an interview I did with John Carlson for, for 20 minutes. You have to listen to John. Huh? I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Listen to John because, because the Washington Post actually picked up on this interview. For 10 minutes, uh, we talked about immigration. John wanted to change the subject, and I said, no, no, wait, I'm not done yet. 
because here's what needs to happen, Enrique. We've got to we've got to reform the immigration uh, uh, system. Period. It's broken. But why aren't and we so, doing that? Why aren't we doing yeah. comprehensive immigration reform instead of having actions like yep. this because that you, are scooping up people that are not always criminal? Yeah. Well, I, I, and, and that is the biggest frustration that I think a lot of members have that want to move this forward. You can't find agreement in between Republicans or Democrats to you know what sh reform should look like. So the frustration that people are feeling out in in our world today is a result, I think, of the inaction and the inability of people to come together. So uh, that's why I, I'm really you know hopeful that we can. F find a way for the people in our own community to sit down and have a you know a civil discourse but we've got to show and lead the way in Congress to sit to, to show people we can sit down and talk about these issues and find a way forward so we have got to reform immigration we have got now I've always been on board with pathway to citizenship that's where I have always been you can go online and you can see how, how, how I lay this all out and why it has to happen but there I have is always fear among immigrants and refugees and right and I understand that too and I've met with uh, our, our uh, friends who have traveled here from other countries who have lived here for many years whose children have come with them and have lived there this is their country and that's why I've supported DACA and that's why uh, Jayapal and I have have uh, come Jayapal, together. Who's, yeah, uh, who have come. district congresswoman. Yes, thank you. We've come together and and, uh, and a Democrat, by the way, and a Democrat <laughs> and uh, a lot further left than 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 some have. But you know what? Again, there are places where we can find agreement that we can move forward. The thing I worried about, to the other part of the question there, I I do worry about the ability of police departments to interact with communities when they're asked to enforce federal law as it, as it relates to immigration. When I was a police officer um, on the street, you would make an arrest when somebody committed a crime. If they committed a crime, they went to jail, and it was de determined while they were in incarcerated that they were uh, an illegal immigrant, then the immigration services would come and have an interview, and then they would decide the fate of the, of the person would they be deported, uh, you know, whatever other options they had avail, uh, available to them. That's how the system, I think, should work today. I, I gotta ask you this too, because you represent a district that has uh, now, the way it has changed, uh, has a good part of central Washington that has a lot of agricultural area. And with this crackdown, okay. have you talked to farm groups about oh, what yeah. that's going to mean because who's yeah. going to do the work that many Americans aren't willing to do? Yeah, um, I have. I, I meet with um, our orchardists and uh, hay farmers. Uh, in fact, people may not know, but even in South King County and in into Pierce County, we have still a large number of dairy farms. Uh, they are desperate for people and especially depend upon immigrant workers not for just a season to pick apples or cherries or harvest other crops but 12 months out of the year to milk their cows so there there is a desperate need for uh, for those workers to to be here and they're very concerned that uh, the, the direction that we may be headed is restricting the the number of workers needed to harvest the crops and therefore our farms go uh, you know, lose lose money and not able to, to bring their, their crops uh, and their products to, to market. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm back there, tr you know, trying to work on that. And okay. Um, oh, by the way, where were you on the travel ban and also the way uh, the state of Washington, the uh, Attorney General here, took mm -hmm. action against them? Did you support what they did? I, I thought that, um, that the President, um, again, we, this, is, this is what Republicans said when President Obama uh, tried to um, write law, immigration law, by uh, executive orders. Now President Trump is trying to write immigration law through executive orders. And we said executive orders back in the Obama administration is, is no way, it's no way to to get to immigration reform. And so I would be very inconsistent if I didn't say to President Trump, executive orders 
uh, in trying to, to correct what's wrong in the immigration system is not the way to get to immigration reform. It has to come legislatively. So I was, I was against what the president uh, did. I was, um, I think it was rolled out in a much, uh, much, well, very destructive way. It wrapped up in innocent people who were in midair on their way to this country, who had a legal right to be here, by the way. Uh, and so what I've said is, look, we need to do this legislatively. He needs to work with Congress to get this accomplished. Okay, another question here from a Leavenworth person, mm -hmm. Linda. Uh, will you work with your Democrat and independent peers in legislating the means to ensure that senior citizens, like myself, I'm in that range now. Me too. And yeah, okay, <laughs> we're together. And yourself, do not lose any benefits to Social Security and Medicare. Many of us would suffer by reduction yeah. of benefits, no matter how much uh, how many they they might be revised. There's a lot of concern mm -hmm. about private privatization. Right. There's also concern about vouchers. Where do you stand on that? Mm -hmm. So, um, for for people who are near retirement age or already uh, at retirement age. Social Security and Medicare will not change. And I touched on Medicare already when we talked about health care. Medicare uh, language will not be changed. Uh, now, I don't know about someday in the future, but uh, in this um, repeal, replace bill, uh, Social Security, we know, will go broke uh, in a few years. So we have to think ahead. So I, I think of it this way, Enrique. When I hired on to the sheriff's office in 1972, I had a retirement plan. In 1974, the retirement plan changed. So people who were hired on in 74, 70, no, 76 or 77, uh, it changed. So when they hired on, they had an expectation, here's what my retirement plan will be. And they could plan for it. So we have got to, because we have so many baby boomers retiring, uh, and so now the, the system is, is stressed, and yes, Sadly, the government has been has in the past borrowed from Social Security, which has helped put us in this hole. But we've got to change the expectation for our children and our grandchildren as to what Social Security may look like in the future. And 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 as far as vouchers and that sort of thing, um, I, I think that for me, it's about giving people maybe a broader choice of how they make it easier for them to save and also have that safety net of Social Security at the same time. Okay, let's go to a question from uh, Laurel in Kent. I would like to know why Congressman Reichert is not actively pursuing the information about President Trump's tax returns. Mm -hmm. The very least would let us know what, uh, that he is not involved financially with Russia. And uh, you actually voted in the House Ways and Means Committee to not yep. force the president to do that. Yep. Why? Yep. So uh, it's Laurel and Kent. I uh, hope Laurel that's not Kent. my sister. Laurel, I, don't <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. Because there's not very many Laurels around. You know, okay. that's an unusual name. Well, you might have to talk to her. Uh, about I might, that. just might have to give her a call after this show. Um, so this again, to me, boiled down to a constitutional uh, issue and and law. So. Um, the, the only person who can ask for um, information from the IRS on individual tax returns uh, is the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, we did this back, if you recall, when the, the Tea Party was targeted by the IRS and um, there was um, evidence coming to us from folks out in the community saying, uh, we are being targeted, and so the 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 law that applies here is for the Ways and Means Committee, because we are the tax writing committee. We have jurisdiction there. The law that applies is, requires or allows us to ask for information from the IRS to make sure that the IRS is applying the tax code appropriately. That's where our jurisdiction lies. So we asked for those tax returns. Um, as a result of misconduct by the IRS in, in holding people, in, in, in holding the tax code, um, uh, applying it equally across the board. So in Mr. Trump's case, it was a, a specific request for a, a specific individual's tax returns. Um, and this was politically motivated, uh, by the way, and I know some of our viewers might disagree with that, but I'm just going to be uh, open and honest about that. Um, 
but you can't, it would, to me it would be like, Enrique, if somebody said to me, you know what, I think Enrique may not be paying his taxes correctly, we need to, you know, the Ways and Means Committee needs to ask for Mr. Uh, Cerny's uh, tax records. Sure. We can't do that. And, and so, the, here's the important thing though, Jason Chavitz from the Oversight Committee is, is conducting an investigation into the, the Russian connection and, and, um, and the general. Uh, also, Bob Goodlatte is from the Judiciary Committee, both Republicans, Chairman, are, is also conducting an investigation. So as those investigations continue, and the Department of Justice, by the way, is also looking into this. So all three of those investigations continue. When that information is made available to us and there is a connection, then, then we come back and revisit that. Then let me ask you another follow-up question related to that. Another person from Kent named John. I don't know if he's a relative or not. No, no I don't have Can any Can you Johns. honestly say that Donald Trump would have won the election without Russian help as a first-rate investigator? Uh, would you stake your reputation on it? <laughs> well, you know, so I appreciate the compliment. But, um, again, I don't have the facts that would lead me to believe that Mr. Trump won only as a result of Russian involvement. But, again, those two investigations were actually three investigations that I mentioned. I, I think that our, our, um, our system, election system, needs to be protected and uh, it's, it's um, if there's any indication that it was somehow influenced by outside forces, whether Russian or other, uh, we need to thoroughly investigate that, find the facts, and make sure it doesn't happen. But so wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we might know whether that's the case if we found, if the president released his returns? I, I think the investigation will turn up those things and then we can, we can move on from there. But it, there are three investigations that are being conducted right now. And, and we've got to depend on, though, again, as, as, you know, the only reason that I was any good at investigating uh, cases is that I always depended upon fact and not innuendos, not rumors. Even though those might lead you to follow a lead, sometimes to a dead end, but you've, you can only base those um, investigations and the final end result on whatever facts you gather. Okay, Diane from Falls City. Do you approve of Steve Van Bannon's appointment uh, to the National Se Security Council, why or why yeah. not? I, 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 you know, I've never met Steve Bannon. I don't know Steve Bannon, and I, and I'll admit to you that I never heard of Steve Bannon before he was appointed. Uh, I think that uh, because I, I, you know, I'm involved in in doing the work of a congressman, um, so I think that we now we have a president who's been uh, been elected. We, and I have a responsibility to represent my constituents. I also have a responsibility to make sure and, that the president and whomever he appoints to any position do their job. And so I think that my responsibility now is to say, okay, Mr. Bannon, there have been some things that have been said about you, but I don't have the facts. Um, I will hold you accountable. You better do your job. That goes for the president. That goes for every other cabinet member. We did it during the Bush era. I disagreed with Bush on a number of things. I disagree with Obama on a number of things, and I'm sure, as already has been seen, I'll disagree with Trump on many things in the, in the future. But does his background Maybe. concern you at all, considering uh, with Breitbart well, yeah. he represented an alt-right and also concerns about, about white nationalism and, and racist actions and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I, yes. I, I don't think that uh, you can ignore those things. Um, uh, I'm aware of those uh, those past that past history, but um, you know, people people change. I don't know Mr. Bannon. I don't know what he's like today. I've never I've never met him. He's been appointed to this position. Uh, we need to see whether or not he's going to perform in a way that's fair to the American people. If he doesn't. Then, then Congress needs to step in. Okay. Uh, from Stahican, Randall, what specific steps are you taking to reopen to uh, reopening access to Cottonwood Camp in the North Cascades National uh, Park? Yeah. American people have been severely limited in their access to the park. Yeah. There's been a lack of funding for the National Park Service. Uh, big yeah. issue for those this, that like to hike. And yeah. Those th things. This is a, I mean, this is an issue that has been gone ongoing for years. And uh, 
the the problem is the, the funding um, for the Stehekin Road, and uh, there is a there is a clash between you know there's conflicting interests there between the environmentalists and business owners and the hikers and campers, uh, and so we've met with people from both sides of uh, the issue. Um, my most recent meeting was just uh, you know a few months ago in, in, in Wenatchee with with a group of people that are concerned about this. Doc Hastings actually passed some legislation that makes it possible to open up Cottonwood, uh, but there was no funding attached to Doc Hastings legislation because earmarks are no longer allowed. So um, I'm hoping to work with the the new secretary Zinke and finding a way forward to make both sides happy. Uh, in, in this. It's not an easy problem to solve, but I'm aware of it, and, uh, and hopefully the new secretary can help us solve that problem. What will you, and this is from, uh, I believe it's Delise or Dallas from Auburn. I hope, sorry if I screwed up your name too much. Uh, what will you do to fund Planned Parenthood health care services now and into the future? Deep concern that uh, yeah. Planned Parenthood is going to lose its funding. Mm -hmm. Organization provides many services to families and individuals. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know that uh, she and others are concerned about recent votes in, in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. on defunding Planned Parenthood uh, and, and directing that uh, you know, federal dollars not be spent on abortions. Uh, so in this state, it, it doesn't affect the state of Washington. So the, the, uh, the, the law now is that every state can make its own decision. So, the Title X money that, that uh, to, to, what, what was her name again, Delise? Delise. Um, the Title X uh, funding that she's concerned about is still funded at the same level, will come to the state of Washington, and the state of Washington still has the ability to decide if that money goes to Planned Parenthood or if it goes to community health centers or some centers or some other public um, health provider uh, that can, um, you know, continue that that uh, that healthcare service, especially to women. That's that's what we're concerned about. So, um, it doesn't affect the state of Washington. They still have the decision. Every state has that decision. Some states they may make may make a different decision. They may give it to community health centers versus Planned Parenthood. But here in the state of Washington, again, Title X monies are there, and the governor can decide where those monies go. Let me let me ask you about this. This just <clears throat> came out today. President Trump has rescinded uh, protections for transgender students that had allowed them to use bathrooms corresponding with their gender identity, over overruling his own uh, education secretary, I'm sure you're aware of that, mm -hmm. uh, placing the administration in the middle of the culture wars. Where do you stand yeah. on that? Well, so the, 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 the thing that this really does is it gives the power back to the states again, just like in the Planned Parenthood uh, situation. So the state of Washington can decide uh, whether or not they want to accommodate transgenders in a, in a specific you know, specific way, which we've decided to do here in this state. It doesn't change anything here in, the wa in Washington state. Other states may decide to do something different, but here in Washington state, we've made a decision and this is what we're going to do in Washington know, But state. doesn't it send a message nationally about transgender people, about, well, you know, whether they're accepted or not? I, you know, I, I believe that every citizen in this country should be, te should be treated uh, equally, should have the same opportunities in housing, in jobs, in health care, in, you know, you name it. But um, I have no control over whether or not the president puts out, uh, you know, a, a directive or, or overrides his secretary. But what I can tell you here in the state of Washington, um, we have made a decision, and, and that decision remains unaffected by what the president directed yesterday. Okay. Now, uh, this comes from Vanessa in Auburn. She says, I've seen reports that the president's first budget intends to cut funding for PBS. Been here before. <laughs> I was raised on Sesame Street, and I'm now glad to have programming like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood to provide educational programming for my young son. Yeah. Will you fight to keep funding for PBS and, of course, the Corporation Absolutely. for Public Broadcasting? Yes. No, there's, there's not a hesitation there because since I came to Congress, and even before Congress, I recognized the benefit of PBS. Again, if, if people would go to my website, look at the voting history, um, I have always been a staunch report, uh, supporter of PBS public broadcasting, and especially in those rural areas where sometimes that's the, you know, the only access they have. So um, the, the, the answer is absolutely yes. 
All right. Uh, a few other areas here, because uh, when they were talking about some of these cuts, they're also, oh, by the way, you have a little more time, right? So we can get a few more questions here. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, we can, sure. I like the yeah. way you did it. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we, yeah we can do some more time. Oh, geez, I'm having on. fun so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep going. Uh, some of the other uh, targets in the funding cuts are Legal Services Corporation, AmeriCorps, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Export-Import Bank, which is extremely crucial to this state yeah. since we are so trade dependent. Yeah. Do you, are, are you backing cuts for these? No, my, my record on those is 100%. XM Bank, um, if you recall, uh, I was one of, I'm trying to remember the, the, the number, I think one of 20 or 30 uh, Republicans who actually signed uh, the uh, uh, discharge petition to bring this vote, force the leadership to bring this vote, it might have been more than that, bring this vote to the floor. I was one of only 10 Republicans who had the courage to stand on the House floor and deliver a speech in support of XM Bank. Um, look, there are over 200 countries that use export-import banks. We would be putting ourselves and risking our jobs in the, the development of small businesses in this state and in this nation if we didn't have export-import support. And so Denny Heck and I, let's talk about bipartisanship, Susan Del Benny and I actually held a town hall, town hall, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm listening. Uh, with, <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with the export-import bank folks, um, and uh, it was up in the Bothell area, and um, uh, so no, I, I'm fully on board with, with uh, all of those efforts. All right, I am yeah. listening. I am yeah, listening. yeah, I know you're Just there. juggling yeah. papers here. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, another fun question here. This comes from James in Kent. A lot of Kent questions here. Why is Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor, talked about sanctions with the Russians and he was fired by the president, right. not being prosecuted for a felony crime as stipulated in the Logan Act? Yeah. So. Uh, again, back to the investigations that are being conducted right now. Department of Justice, the Judicial uh, Committee with Bob Goodlatte and John Car Conyers as the lead Democrat, and then Jason Shavitz, and I'm, I'm not, I'm forgetting the, uh, the ranking member's name on the Oversight Committee, but uh, those two committees have jurisdiction and oversight over this issue. They've called for an investigation. And, and it's been referred to the Department of Justice. So they, he is under investigation. Where the facts lead, uh, we'll hopefully all find out together. All right, um, just a couple more questions here. Uh, this is from Suzanne in Indiano Indianola. Um, good question here, I think. Mm -hmm. In a divided and anxious time, America is depending on congressional Republicans to defend essential democratic institutions, such as the free press, which we talked about, yeah. independent judiciary, congressional checks and balances on administrative powers. Will you add your voice to those condemning denigration of these institutions? And I think she's specifically talking about things that the president has said. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. I mean, that's my job. Um, I, I uh, you know, I just want to lay out sort of a a history very quickly. Uh, when I first came to Congress in 2005, um, I brought with me my independent sheriff's minded attitude. <laughs> and um, three months into my job, uh, our more senior citizens uh, living in the district might remember there was a vote on the Terry Schiavo case in Florida. And Tom DeLay was the majority leader and said, you will all vote yes on this bill to have congressional oversight into whether or not her <laughs> life support is, uh, is, is sustained or removed. And we, I landed on a Friday night, got a message to fly back, flew back. The vote was at midnight on Sunday. I walked in. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I walked in and I voted no. And I was one of five Republicans who voted against Tom DeLay. I'd only been there three months. I'm not like a senior guy. I still got to make my way through the system and find my, my voice. But that was absolutely wrong. Congress had no role in deciding this. This was between the family, between their God and their doctor, period. So when we go forward and there is any contradiction to the Constitution, to our civil rights, I'm going to stand up. I will be a voice. 
and I will call attention to it, and I'll be one of those who says, you know what, this is, this is not the way that the American people want this to be accomplished. We are so divided right now. What is your responsibility and how, how do you bring us together? Because yeah. we seem to be so split around party lines. I know. I, I'm, it's just, uh, I, I think that what you know, we see on the street, um, sad. I'm sad by it. Um, I, I wish uh, I wish I had the answer. Uh, I think it really is, the bottom line is, for people to, to take a deep breath, let's all calm down, let's have a you know, conversation, let's find a way forward, let's find a solution. Um, one of the ways that I've tried to do that is to reach out, because it's police and community, so not only on ways and means, I, I chair the trade subcommittee, I serve on the tax committee, I also serve on the Human Resources Committee. Things in there are, in the Human Resources very near and dear to my heart, foster children, adoptions, and those sorts of things. But one of the things that I did was work to bring a group of people together. It's a, it's a working group to find out how we can move this country forward when it comes to relations between police and community. So we have, um, on the Democrat side, John Conyers leading a group of six people from the Black Caucus. Uh, we have on the Republican side a racial mixture of six members of Congress and varying degrees of law enforcement and civil service uh, experience. We have been to Detroit. We have been to uh, Atlanta. We have met uh, with the people from Baltimore on more than one occasion. These are civic leaders. Uh, social activists, faith-based community, law enforcement, city officials, educators, uh, college uh, prof uh, professors and presidents to say, and oh, most importantly, the young people who are growing up in those neighborhoods with no hope. And, and I think that, you know, I've reached out to John Lewis. I know John. He works on the Ways and Means Committee with me. We did an op-ed piece together saying it's time to bring America together. If you could put that on your, on your site so people could read that. We'll look for it. Because I think here's the, here's the, you know, where you've got, and we can send it to you, but it's on our Facebook page, by the way, and we, I think we have it on other social media outlets in, in, uh, from our office. But here you have an African-American civil rights leader, Democrat, uh, and then you have, of course, the opposite in me, uh, Caucasian, law enforcement career, um, 33 years, Republican, who have come together and said, because right now it's cops and and in in ethnic communities that are you know doing this. So I came to him and said, you know what, we're the two perfect people to lead a path forward to peace. And uh, and it took a while for us to come to some language, but uh, I would just encourage everybody. I am, I am ready and willing to talk. Uh, I am ready and willing to do anything back in D.C. to bring people together, to travel to other cities, to come to our district, to sit down with people uh, of every religion, race, ethnic uh, background, religious background, educational. Um, and I take it you didn't appreciate what the president said then about John Lewis. I'm, I don't. I don't well, think. Oh, and he made he made comments, and when John Lewis had criticized him. Oh, that a uh, couple months ago. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. You 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 uh, have. To, it boils down to me to you know you've got to have respect for everyone. People can disagree. Enrique, you and I have known each other for a long time. We don't agree on a lot of things. Yeah. But you know what? We're good friends. I consider ourselves to be good friends. There are things that we agree on. And, and we chose to come here today because we know that you have opposite views that I do. We know that, I know that you would ask me tough questions, but I also know that, that you are respectful of people. And that's the thing, that's the only thing I'm asking for people out there to be is respectful. Protests are fine, peaceful. Uh, and, and, and the people who are protesting day, today, I understand it the right way. They contacted the police department, they have a permit. Um, 
they're trying to stay on the sidewalk, but I think there's way too many people yeah. <laughs> to do that. But any, anyway, you, you get the picture. I, I'm, yeah. I, I just want to make America better. You know, I want to bring people together. All right. Well, thank you for your time. We appreciate yeah. it very much. Thank all you. All I do is try. Yep. And you know, I got a present here. I'm going to give you Off. all of these. Uh, okay. Actually, you know what? My staff probably we has a lot put, of these. We already. even put them all on a thumb drive for okay. you. Okay. Every one of them. Great. So that you can have uh, some good reading during your off time. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time, Congressman. Thank you. We Thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. This KCTS 9 Digital Studios original made possible with your support. Thank you.